14, please. Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Now, today is our last classes uh, in Paul's epistle to Titus. Uh, we're going to be doing verses 14 and 15 this morning, which basically contains final instructions from Paul and also greetings. There's an exchange of greetings between the people who are with Paul and uh, those in, uh, in uh, Crete. And also, uh, could you turn your uh, songbooks to page 68? We're going to do How Great Thou Art. <clears throat> How Great Thou Art. And um, also, just a, uh, remember we have our Lord, uh, the Lord's Supper, first Sunday of the month. We have uh, the observance of the communion table. So we'll be doing that at the end as well. And also, just a reminder that uh, starting ne- uh, our next book is going to be on Sundays is Colossians, but it will probably be about a month before we do that book. We're actually going to do several different subjects uh, in between books. And I think, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I've been announcing this, we're going to be doing a subject called Annihilationism. And you might be saying, what is that? Well, basically, it's, it's the doctrine out there. It's a false doctrine that teaches that and, and some, even some Bible, famous Bible teachers have, have gone in for it, is that uh, when the unsaved dies, they just no longer exist. They don't suffer eternal condemnation, meaning they don't suffer forever and ever in the lake of fire. So we're going to show that that's wrong. I'm going to show you the passages of Scripture. It's actually very important because it's going to affect the way we evangelize. It's also, uh, we're misrepresenting to the unbeliever uh, uh, that if we we say that they no longer exist after they die, it's uh, it's actually misrepresenting what God's word says. So uh, it's very important for us to, in evangelism and also, of course, in our understanding of God. So it's actually going to be uh, not only just that, but there's also some a couple other things ab- uh, about the basis for the unsaved's condemnation. And uh, so we're going to be dis- discussing the holiness of God, too, as well, and the love of God, as well, because God desires all men to be saved. He doesn't want them to face his wrath. He sent his son in our place to face that wrath. So uh, that'll be uh, the next, next three Bible classes. And then we're going to be doing a subject called, and I don't think I've ever taught, I've never taught it here. I've taught it taught different subjects related to, uh, it was involved with other subjects. Mainly it's going to be about, it's, it's the importance of uh, other uh, believers gathering together with each other, why it's actually important, why the scriptures want us all to gather together with each other. And then we're going to be doing, the, uh, that's one week, and then we're going to do one another commands, which I think you'll find, I've never done it uh, here, uh, one another commands, there's a bunch of one another commands in the scriptures, and so we're going to be, uh, be going into those uh, they basically deal with our relationship with each other, and, and it shows how we. Ex- uh, this subject uh, tells us how we ex- express the love of God in our lives. So that'll be a two, uh, two part series, and then we'll do Colossians. and And during the week, you know, if you can, if you can't get here, or you can just go to our website. Uh, we've been starting uh, the uh, history of the English Bible. We finished the book of Daniel, and then we're doing the history of the English Bible, not the Bible, but the history of the English Bible, and uh, we'll be doing that uh, f- f- uh, into next week, and then we're going on to a subject called canonicity. Uh, basically, that deals with the subject as to why certain bio- books got into the Bible and, some, and why others did not. So we'll talk about the, the, the criteria that the church had in order to determine uh, to uh, rec- uh, determine which books were actually um, should uh, were inspired by God. In fact, this will answer the question: Did the church determine the canon? And we'll see that no, they didn't. Uh, they simply recognized that which was already inspired by God, that already had authority. And then we'll be doing the subject of ins- inspiration: this, that the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures. And then we'll be doing inerrancy. There's no errors in the Bible in the original languages of Scripture. That's extremely important. And then, uh, then we might be doing something on textual criticism. I've uh, been asked to... Uh, it seems like we might be end up doing that, and I think you'll find that interesting. Uh, basically, you know, we the scholars we don't have the original autographs, so it's we have tons of copies, uh, and so uh, thousands and thousands of copies. And basically, I'm going to go through uh, why uh, what scholars do to determine uh, what the original text says, and we'll, you'll be uh, I think you'll really be enlightened about it because there are people on you know, the History Channel, Discovery Channel, whatever, and they'll say, oh, we can't ever really get back to what the original text says. That's, that's a joke, and I'll show you why. So, um, and then we'll be doing the next book during the weekday classes will be Second Timothy. So that's the coming attractions, and uh, uh, again, um, we're going to be uh, 
noting Titus 3, 14 and 15, uh, wrapping up that book here this morning. So let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves. We take this moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of any sin that uh, we need to confess. Confession of sin restores our fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit, and we maintain that fellowship with God simply by obeying what the Holy Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God. That's when you're being filled with the Spirit, which is commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. And remember, that's synonymous with the command of Colossians 3, 16, to let the word of Christ richly dwell in your soul. Uh, we know that because bo- if you look at both passages, they bear the same results. And that makes sense because 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says that the Holy Spirit has inspired the scriptures. So when you're obeying the word of God, you're actually obeying the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of be- uh, believers, they, they kind of make it, um, they, they, dis- dis- uh, they, they disassociate themselves from the personal aspect of the, hearing the word of God. God is speaking to you and me through the teaching of the word of God. So uh, a lot of people get uh, messed up with the, the communicator, and the communicator is important, but I'm the instrument that God uses, and other men, pastors or evangelists, that God uses to uh, speak to uh, through uh, to the church. And so he uses the man, the gift, the past, the teacher, to speak to the church and uh, through the teaching of the word of God. In fact, every time that you obey the word of God, remember, we're all supposed to be at some point, grow up enough, we're able to teach others. In fact, that's what we're supposed to do, all of us, men and women. And it says that in, at the end of Hebrews, and at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 6. So we should be able, when we're doing that, when we're able to teach others, the Holy Spirit is actually speaking through us. So this is extremely important. The Bible is a living book, and God uh, uses, uh, the Holy Spirit works through the teaching of the Word of God. So this is extremely important. We were supposed to worship the Father as Jesus taught the woman at the well. And John 4, we're to worship the Father by means of the Spirit and truth. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for another day, being so gracious to us, saving us from our sins, saving us from eternal condemnation, giving us new life, eternal life, and a relationship and fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that at the moment that we trusted in your Son, that you identified us with your Son in his death and resurrection, giving us the victory over death and giving us a victory over sin and Satan. We just thank you and praise you for doing this for us. And we just thank you for loving us when we were yet your enemies. Help us to always remember that, that you loved us when we were your enemies, when we could care less about you. And you sent your son to the cross to die for us sinners. And we just thank you for this great love. And we pray that we would use, uh, respond to this love by being more obedient to you, to also reflecting this love in our relationship with other believers and all people whether they're saved or unsaved, so that we could bring glory to you and reveal to others that we're disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for uh, everyone that is here this morning, those who might be uh, also on Pal Talk or the website. We thank you for everyone here this morning. We thank you for your children who are here that want to learn your word, that find it important to learn your word and so that they can bring glory to you. We thank you for them. We thank you, Father, for... Uh, the Thompsons opening up their home and their hospitality and Titus's work with the sound and the recordings. And uh, we just thank you for his work and the technology. And we just, so that uh, people around the world uh, could listen to the word of God here in Iowa, uh, people in other parts of this uh, country in the world, in Tasmania, where the Fletchers are, and in other parts of this country, in Texas and Massachusetts and uh, in Minnesota and uh, all around the globe in India. Uh, We just thank you, Father, for these people, and we thank you for this technology. We pray that you give wisdom to Titus uh, with the sound and the recordings this morning. We also, we pray that you would give grace to the communicator myself 
Help me to be humble and sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. Help me to accurately interpret and communicate your word to your people. Help your people to, through the Spirit, be receptive to what they're hearing, to understand that you're speaking to them through the teaching of the Word of God, and help them to make application of what they're learning. We also pray, Father, that uh, they would be blessed not only with Christ-like character as a result of obedience to this teaching, but they might bring glory to you in their daily lives. Uh, show all of us in this ministry the importance of what we're learning so that we can reach out to all people in our periphery, whether it's family, friends, people on the job, or our neighbors. And we just pray, Father, that we continue to draw closer to you, continuing to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So and we also pray for the song service. We pray that you would help us all in singing and to enjoy ourselves. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, could you all rise and turn to page 68 if you haven't already. We're going to do How Great Thou Art, the acoustic version of it. Sing. 
song. <laughs> the guy who used to sing it for Billy Graham was great. Big baritone voice. He used to sing it great. I think he wrote it too. So let's see. Uh, it should be a Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, we have... Uh, Two verses to cover here this morning, wrap up this epistle, this tiny little epistle, which deals with the emphasis, is, deals with uh, performing good works. And uh, remember, uh, good works or excellent works, uh, these are works that are performed under the power of the Holy Spirit. So basically, what, the, uh, what uh, uh, this epistle would uh, deal with in relation to the Cretan church is that when they, if the Cretan church obeyed what Paul was teaching in this letter, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, like the rest of Scripture, if they obeyed what the Holy Spirit said through Paul's teaching in this epistle, they would perform good works or excellent works, works that are beneficial and useful, uh, not only to the church, but in other people, the unsaved, but also to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also, uh, they bring glory to God because they're done in God's power. So uh, you can't perform a good work uh, outside of the Word of God. If uh, you think you can do that, that's dece you've been deceived. We can only perform good works if we're obeying what the Holy Spirit teaches us and the word of God. So if the Cretan church obeys this epistle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the rest of Paul's teaching, his gospel, sound doctrine, they will perform good works that are pleasing to God. And also, remember, we studied this in the subject of the Bama Seed evaluation of the church. All of us are going to stand before the, the Bama Seed of Christ at, after the rapture of the church, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and other places. Uh, we're going to have to give an account for how we, what we did with our time, talent, and treasure and truth, what kind of stewards we were with the things that God, the blessings that God has given to us and our spiritual gift, and also determine if we get rewards because of the good works that we perform. What did we perform for good works? At that time, our lives, our, our service will be evaluated. So this is an extremely important epistle, not only for uh, the Cretan church back in Paul's day in the first century, but it still has great application for the church today and here in the 21st century. So the church should do well. It would be smart to listen to what Paul is teaching us. So it says in Titus chapter 3, verse 14, uh, it says in the New American Standard, our people must, be, uh, must also learn, he says, to engage in good deeds and to meet pressing needs why? So that they will not be unfruitful. Now, this verse is actually what we call an emphatic affirmation. It's affirming what Paul uh, said in Titus chapter 3, verse 13. It emphasizes the importance of, uh, of what Paul is saying here. This verse is uh, emphasizing the importance of what Paul's saying in this verse. When he says, our people, he's speaking of the Christian community and specifically the Cretan Christian community. Now remember, they, they were like, uh, they're like, they're much like us, uh, and, and, and we see that uh, the Cretans, uh, they were in a culture that was ungodly. Remember the Cretans, that, that those people on that island were famous for being, noto they were notorious for being criminals and pirates and uh, dishonest people who lied, uh, lazy gluttons as we saw in, was it Titus 1.12? So th God saved them out of that culture. And so the Cretan church had a lot of pressure on them from the ungodly cosmic uh, system that was surrounding them, the jobs that they went to, the neighbors that they had, uh, the, the people they dealt with in the marketplace, all ungodly people and a very corrupt culture, ungodly culture. And here's God saved this these group of people, uh, the church at Crete, and he put them in that, uh, saved them out of that terrible culture and brought them uh, and saved them so that they can also lead others to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light. And so these people had a great pressure on them uh, uh, against of the devil's world to not do God's will. And Paul understood that. Same thing with our day and age. We live in a very corrupt society. Uh, I'm not just talking immorality in our culture. We're just surrounded by people who are not going to uh, encourage us to walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord. They're not going to encourage us uh, to study our Bible or to pray. They're not going to encourage us to gather with the other people. They're not going to encourage us to learn God's plan and to live this spiritual life. And the same thing was in the, in the Cretan culture. So we see that uh, 
Despite that, God has given us the power so that we can bring glory to him, that we can execute God's plan for our lives, even though we live in ungodly culture. And that's what we study with Daniel in the book of Daniel, if you recall. Daniel was in a pagan culture, the Babylonian culture, a, uh, a culture that uh, uh, was terrible. Uh, he was in exile, a Jewish exile. He didn't speak the language. He had to learn the language. He had to learn the culture. And he was working for a wicked pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. Yet he brought glory to God despite that. Because he, tr he learned God's word, he trusted and had faith in God that God would take care of him. He was obedient to God, he prayed to God, he obeyed his word, and he brought glory to God. And he's one of the great saints of the Old Testament that we can learn from. Well, the Cretan church, uh, they were a group of people that had the same pressure on them as we have here in the 21st century in America. Now, when it says must learn to engage, uh, in the uh, Greek we have the word manthano, translated must learn, and then we have the word proistemi, and this uh, word, uh, which is translated to engage in. Now, both are good translations. The verb manthano refers to the Cretan church being devoted. This word manthano, when it says must learn to engage in, the word manthano is referring to being devoted dedicated to something, and here being occupied with performing good deeds. So this, it's interesting, in the, the verb is in the present imperative form. Now that is what we, it's in Greek grammar, it's called a customary present imperative, and that means to us that it indicates that as a general precept, the Cretan church must be devoted to performing good deeds, and it denotes that they are to be characterized as performing good deeds. So this, as a general precept, is what it said to the Cretan churches, we need to be regularly doing this. This must be our, we must be a people that is characterized as performing good deeds. So whatever you do in life for another person, which is the result of your obedience to God, loving your neighbors yourself, you are bringing glory to God. You're performing a good deed. And when you obey what the Word of God says, yeah, that is going to be a good deed that's pleasing to God that will be rewarded. And it also, it builds up your character when you do this. Jesus performed good deeds. The apostles performed good deeds in the power of the Spirit. We're to follow in their example. So this, uh, this word, this present imperative form of this verb, Montano, means this is a general precept and that the, the Cretan church should be characterized as performing these good deeds. Now, the word proistemi, it means to engage in or to perform because it pertains to an action that follows established procedures or fulfills agreed-upon requirements. And it indicates here that Paul wanted the Cretan church to make it their habit of being devoted to performing excellent works in the sense that these actions are the direct result of Paul's spirit-inspired commands and prohibitions in this epistle. So this speaks of being involved in the activity of performing excellent works on behalf of others, and it expresses the idea of commitment of being or being committed to performing good ex, uh, performing excellent works. So the idea here with this word is you're dedicated, you're devoted to these things. This is something that your your life is centered upon. See, uh, we we say, we show we love God by our actions and our words, and our priorities. And so if we love God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength in our neighbor as ourself, this will manifest itself in our obedience to God's commands. So we'll be dedicated and devoted to Him. And this, we'll be dedicated and devoted to performing these good works. The present tense of this verb, proistemi, is a customary present, and it's used to indicate that Paul wanted the Cretan church to make it their habit of being devoted to making it their habit of performing excellent works. What's interesting, in the middle voice of the verb here, it's what we call a causative middle. It's quite interesting. I reflected in my translation. Basically, it means that they were to the Cretan church was to discipline themselves. Discipline is a huge thing that the church has to have, and we can only get it through the Spirit's power. So discipline means that we stick to things. That, like, for instance, you go to work. You're disciplined and go into work. Uh, you, have a, you have a certain hour, time you have to be at work. You've got to be disciplined to go into work. Uh, you want to be a good uh, a baseball player or a good golfer. You got to be good. You have to be disciplined. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do in life. Uh, if you want to be good at something, you must be disciplined. It's something that you regularly do and you try to excel in. And same thing in Christianity. Jesus Christ, our Savior, uh, he wants us to be disciplined and taking in the Word of God, gathering together with other believers, taking uh, to, uh, com the communion service, observing that, uh, also praying. We have corporate prayer meetings. We should be every day 
as individuals, we should be prayerfully in the word of God and also whatever that time we can devote to it and in prayer. So these things, it takes discipline to do. And so if, you're not, if we're not disciplined in that, we need to go to God and say, God, I'm, I'm weak in this area. I don't study my Bible as much as I should, or I'm weak in this other area. Uh, ask God to help you, and he will. He will help you. I, I know that because he's done that for me, and he's done that for other people in their lives. So we see here that the, the causative middle means that the Cretans were to discipline themselves of performing good works. This wasn't just going to happen by accident. They had to make a volitional decision to make up their minds to do these things. They, it, so they had to make up their mind if this was going to be a priority for them or not. Now, good works here, uh, we have a couple of words. Uh, the word for good is kalos, and the word for works is ergon. And this, we've seen these two words, uh, it, you find them quite a bit in Titus together, and you see them in 1 Timothy, and they're very important words. Uh, the noun ergon, works, it means works, so you could translate it actions, and it, because it refers to actions performed by the church while in fellowship with God. They are actions produced by the Holy Spirit through the Christian when they exercise faith in the Word of God, and this faith results in obedience to the will of the Father, which is revealed by the Spirit in the Word of God. So, uh, when the Holy Spirit is speaking through the teaching of the Word of God, whether you're listening to your pastor in your own private study, or another Christian is talking to you about the Word of God, uh, we exercise faith in it, and we'll know we're having faith in God's Word when we're obeying His commands and prohibitions in His Word. So, this is how we know we are operating in faith. It's our obedience. Now, all of this speaks of the works or actions that the Holy Spirit performs through the Christian as a result of the Christian's obedience to the commands and prohibitions in the Word of God, which are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, the word for good there, kalos, as I said before, it describes these works or actions as being of the highest moral quality or character. And why that is is because they're done in the power of the Spirit as a result of obedience to the Spirit-inspired commands and prohibitions in the Word of God. So this, these works or actions are not, you know, any old good thing. They're of the highest moral quality and character because they're the result of obeying the Holy Spirit, who again is speaking, us to, speaking to us through the teaching of the Word of God. And the implication is that these works or actions are useful and a great benefit to the church, the entire human race, and to the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And also to ourselves, because we'll be rewarded for these works. So Paul mentions something as to why Jesus, Christ, why we were saved, why the Father saved us, was to perform good works. Uh, if you could hold your place, uh, look at, um, look at uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 14. And, and actually, you can turn to my translation too, if you'd like. I'm going to read from that. So the... Uh, the twofold purpose for the first advent of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection was so that, you know, we could uh, perform good works. And free it. And he also did that. He went to the cross to free us from every lawless deed, right? But also to do good works for him. <clears throat> so look at uh, Titus 2.14, and I'm reading from my translation. He gave himself, that's Jesus, gave himself on behalf of each and every one of us, the church, as a substitute, so as the set so as to set each and every one of us free from each and every lawless action. Okay, that's the first pur purpose for the death and resurrection of Jesus. As well as, the, here's the second one, as well as to purify a special people for himself. You are a special person. God says you are. You're in union with Christ. You've, he's, uh, you're identified with Christ. You're a child of God. You're adopted Roman style into God's family. You have the Spirit indwelling you, not to mention the Father and the Son. You are a child of God. You're a royal priest. You're a royal ambassador for Christ. You're a special person. Then it says, he purified a people for himself who are dedicated, look at it says, to performing excellent works. Same expression, excellent works, is also found in Titus 3.14. So we see uh, right here that God wants us to perform good works. One of the, the reason why the Father sent His Son to the cross for us and then raised Him from the dead, seated Him at the right hand of the Father, is so we will perform good works. We're not here to just sit around and collect, uh, you know, waste time until you know, He takes us home at the rapture. We get work to do. We need to be about our business. Now listen to me. A lot of churches are out there doing works. 
but they don't have any teaching behind what they're doing. We know that because the, time, the lack of time spent in teaching the church today and many churches today, they're not getting educated in the Word of God. So basically when they, that's happening, what they're doing is dead works because it's not in obedience to the Spirit in, the, in His teaching in the Word of God because they don't know the Word of God. If they don't know the Word of God, how can they w perform works and actions that are good that are Spirit-driven and Spirit-empowered? So well, if you don't know your Word, the Word of God, and you don't apply it, you're not going to perform a good work. And there are a lot of churches that are doing all kinds of stuff. they got their people on a works program, trying to keep the people active and busy. And basically, it's just dead works. It's all the flesh. It's not in spirit and powered. Uh, let me tell you something. Put it this way. I'm here today. I'm teaching the word of God. I'm spirit driven. I'm doing what God the Holy Spirit tells me to do. He's motivating me to be here. Whether I want to feel like it, I've had a fight in the cold since I, this past week. I'm here because I love him. I want to. I want to. I want to help God's people. I'm here for you. I'm here for him, and I'm. I'm here because the Spirit is moving me to. And so uh, I stayed in Iowa because God, the Holy Spirit, has moved me to stay here. I'm staying here in obedience to Him. So when I say that is because that's the way we got to be. Paul, look at Paul. Better example. Much better example. Paul. All the things he did was in obedience to God. He obeyed the Holy Spirit. He performed great works. He did so much for God, and also he was he did so much for the church and all people. Society, you know, Western culture has a, a should thank uh, thank uh, the Apostle Paul personally because of much of what we have in Western culture and the Judeo Christian ethic is a result of Paul's evangelism of among pagan peoples in Europe. Uh, so. We see here that God wants us to perform good works. Look at, uh, he saved us so that we would perform good works. Uh, look at, hold your place in Titus. Look at Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and look at verse 1. Now, what Paul says in Titus 2 is very similar to, in a lot of ways, if you look at Titus, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. It's very interesting. The parallels, I think. Both, both passages talk about our salvation, and also both talks about, talk, talk about that our salvation, the ultimate purpose of saving us is to perform good works. Look at Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is the Ephesian church before they became Christians. And this is true of us, obviously. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, of course, that is Satan. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, that's the unsaved. We were, we were like them one time. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The flesh is speaking of the sin nature. And were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, why? Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why did he do this? Well, a couple of reasons. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, he works there is talking about, you know, the unsaved. They can't do anything to gain the approbation of God or be approved by God or accepted by God by anything they do. But only faith in Christ, who's the object of our faith, is the reason why God saved us. Once we're saved, though, now we got to talk about works because now we have the spirit and the capacity to perform works that are pleasing to God. And the very next verse is connected to all what Paul said. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, look at it says, for good works. Same expression we saw in Titus 2.14 and in Titus 3.14. Which God, look at it says, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You know what the word walk means? It means a lifestyle, how we live our life. So let me, take, let me uh, give you a little insight. A lot of people, when they think good works, they think the big production, you know, you got to do some great evangel, like Billy Graham and go out and evangelize all these people. I mean, look at, 
Do your, your daily duties. Love you. The word of God says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. That's sacrificial. Wives, obey your husbands as unto the Lord in all things. That's a good work if you do it. Children, obey your parents in all things as unto the Lord. You do that, you're doing performing good works. You do your job at work. Do your job as unto the Lord. That's a spirit-inspired command. That's a good work if you obey it. Everything you do, love your neighbors yourself, help the, you might have a little, uh, uh, somebody who is in need in your, in your neighborhood or something, and you help them out. That's, and you, you do it because God says, love my neighbors myself. So you do it. Whatever you do under the, uh, under the obedience to the Holy Spirit and the word of God, that's a good work. So it doesn't have to be these, you know, you don't have to be a pastor to perform a good work. You could be a pastor, you could be a good, performing good works as a slave, Christian slaves in the first century. Many of them performed great works. They didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't have, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the things that we have in our day and age. They didn't have the, 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 the luxuries and the status and the freedom we have in America today in the 21st century. They had no freedom. But they brought glory to God. And we can, no matter what you do, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it, God is in every little thing. In the mundane task of life, whatever you do, it brings glory to God. If you do it, whatever you do in, in, the, in the power of the Spirit brings glory to God. And it doesn't matter what it is. It, God's in the mundane things. He wants you in every aspect. I mean, look at what do you think Jesus was doing? You know, there's always talking about before Jesus' ministry, what, you know, his teenage years and his 20s. What was Jesus doing? He's performing good works. He was, by, he was loving his neighbors himself. He was loving God with his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And his character was unusual. He was a perfect man, the greatest miracle there, if you ask me. And he goes, he, he did everything he did. He was a carpenter's son, so he worked as a carpenter. He just did the everyday things of life, giving us an example to follow. He wasn't tearing, tearing the world upside down at that point. He's just doing the very the, the tasks we all, doing his job, you know, taking care of his mom and his dad, his, getting along with brothers and sisters, helping people out in the neighborhood. And, it, you know, and that's what Jesus did. That's what we got to be doing. We got to live like him. And everything, you know, everything is important. That's why it doesn't matter what you're doing in life. You know, it, you can, it, it, God can, if you know these things, God can turn the whole, your whole world upside down and you'll look at life totally different. It's all about perspective. Life is exciting whether you're digging a ditch or it can be, if you, life can be exciting if you're digging a ditch, you're a housewife, you're a child uh, under the authority of your parents, uh, whatever you want to do. You're, you're a policeman, you you're, you're work for the post office, you're a nurse, you're a doctor. Uh, whether you're, whatever you do in life, whatever your occupation is, it can be exciting if you know these things. It's important that we see this. Because God's trying to use, help us, and also he wants us to, to use us to help others and to bring glory to him and his son. So go back to Titus chapter 3, please. So it says in Titus 3.14, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds. And then it says, to meet pressing needs. Uh, pressing needs is interesting. It's, the word pressing there is the word anankaios, and, uh, anan anankaios, excuse me, and that's translated pressing, a little bit of uh, a mouthful there. And the word for needs is krea. So we have anankaios, pressing, and krea, which is the word for needs. Krea is an interesting word. We see it quite a bit in the New Testament. It's in the plural. It's correctly translated. It refers to that which other Christians were lacking or particularly necessary or essential for proper human existence. These needs were material ones, such as food, shelter, and clothing. Now, this word krea is used in the same manner as it is here in Titus 3.14 in other places in the New Testament. So, therefore, in Titus 3.14, this noun krea means needs and functions as the object of the preposition ace, is, and it's, which is functioning as a marker of purpose. That's why the New American Standard translates uh, the phrase for 
pressing needs, uh, to meet pressing needs, excuse me. So this purpose, uh, it, Paul's, what we see here with this prepositional phrase is Paul is presenting Paul, uh, his purpose for wanting the Cretan church to make it their habit of being devoted to performing excellent works. So in other words, when he says uh, to meet pressing needs, that phrase is giving us the purpose as to why Paul wants the Cretan church to be making their habit of being devoted to performing excellent works. Now, that word that's translated pressing, anankaios, it means essential, and it, need, it speaks of the essential needs of people and is speaking of the necessities of life, or in other words, that which is essential to maintaining human life. So Paul's saying, I want you to do these things and, uh, for, for pressing, uh, for essential needs, things that people need. Now, they, we don't have a lot of this, uh, we wouldn't have a, a lot of this uh, problem that Paul had in the first century, because we live in a very wealthy society. There's very few people around us, I think, that, that are really lacking for essential needs. I mean, the things of life. I mean, we have people worried about getting a flat screen TV in our, in our society. We're talking about people who don't have anything. It's like, for instance, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're examining the, the possibility of, I've been invited to go to India to teach for a week a bunch of pastors, and, you know, uh, Dr. Mancha down in uh, Alabama is uh, exploring it with uh, Pastor Sadia in, in India. They don't have any. These people in India are poor. I mean, you'd be shocked at the poverty that's over there. So if we do end up going over there, which would be nice, you know, they're, they're people very, they, live, they have pressing needs. These people are with a destitute. You know, they're looking for their next meal. Uh, they're not looking for a flat screen TV or a computer or an iPhone. Uh, they're looking to just get by for another day and actually live. That's the idea what Paul's talking about here. All right? So we see here that he, then he says, it's interesting, he says in Titus 3.14, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Uh, so that they will not be unfruitful is, the, is presenting the purpose for which Paul is commanding the Cretan church to make it their habit of being devoted to performing excellent works for essential needs. Unfruitful is the word arkapos, which speaks of the Christian being unproductive for God. But what in, in what sense? Well, in the sense that they don't perform these excellent works, uh, which are the result of obeying the Spirit-inspired apostolic commands in the New Testament. Thus, it speaks of the absence of performing good works, which fulfill the purpose for the Father saving us, the Christian, through the death and resurrection of His Son and having the Holy Spirit appropriate the benefits of His Son's death and resurrection at our conversion. So Titus 3.14, if you could read my translation with me, please. There's some inter something, a couple of things I want to bring in before we go to the last verse I want to talk about. It says in Titus 3.14, Yes, indeed, our people, the Christian church at Crete, must make it their habit of being devoted to performing excellent works for essential needs. Why? In order that they would not be unfruitful. Now, the first century apostolic church, apostolic meaning under the authority of the apostles, they practice pro providing for the needs of its own. Uh, this is very, uh, this is clear in Acts chapter 2, Romans 15, uh, also 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, and 2 Corinthians 9, 1 through 15. In God's love, there's to be reciprocation between, reciprocation means they do something for you, you do something for them. In God's love, there's to be reciprocation between us believers in the sense that there is to be a mutual exchange of care and concern among believers for one another. And we're gonna when we study in a couple of weeks, this the, the two weeks on the one another commands of Scripture, this is made clear. God wants us to be concerned and, and about each other. And, and we're to reciprocate. We have a, sh a care and concern for each other. Remember, we're members of the body of Christ, Christ being in the head. The hand cannot say to the eye, I have no need of you. We need each other. I need you. You need me. But also, think about this. When one member hurts, they all hurt. If you're hurting spiritually or something's going on in your life, I hurt. And it should be the same way for, with you in relation to me. We should be like this to each other. So if one person is struggling spiritually, I'm struggling with them in prayer, and maybe at some point struggling with them as they go through this stuff. But we're all part of, we all should be having a mutual concern for each other. We're on the same team. And not just our church with each other, but all, all Christians. So 
The early church practiced this whole thing of being concerned for the needs of each other. Divine love, God's love, involves a reciprocal relationship among believers in the sense of there being a mutual sharing of feelings, actions, responsibilities, and attitudes between believers. And we're going to study this exact point when we do the important, in a couple of weeks, the importance of the, why God wants the church to gather with each other, the importance of it. And it brings out this aspect of it when we study it. We have a relationship with each other. We're a family. Look at your family, your blood family, my blood family. I'm closer to you than I am my own blood, my own family. You know, they say blood is thicker than water. Let me think. God's family, that's your family. Jesus said to him, when they, they wanted to take him away, his mother, and fa- his mother Mary and, her, and her, his brothers were out there and his sisters were saying, hey, they wanted to take him because he was, thought he was nuts. And, you know, he, they said, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. He goes, who are my mother and my brothers, my sisters, but those who hear the word of God and do it. You know, Tony and Susan. Yes, Tyler and even Cheyenne and, 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 and Titus and Jody and the Fletchers and Alice and George and Pixie and the Manches and the Coppersmith. These, all, these people are, you're my family. And so I'm closer, I'm close to, heck, I'm closer to Cheyenne and, than my own, and Tyler than my own nieces and nephews. So that tells you how I think about you. You're my family. I care about you. So God's love involves us having a reciprocal, reciprocal relationship with each other in the sense that we have a, we have a mutual sharing of feelings, actions, and responsibilities and attitude between believers. In fact, what I'm saying is, it's about others. It's not about us. We're not the focus. We're to focus on others. So God's love involves reciprocation among believers in the sense that believers are to share together as partners in the needs and concerns and burdens and joys and cons- blessings for the purpose of encouragement, comfort, challenge, exhortation, praise, prayer, and physical help according to the needs and ability. Uh, if you could, uh, go over to, um, let's see, I want to go to Acts chapter 2. Please. Acts chapter 2. I want to show you what the early first century church, how they were with each other. And we'll see this in a couple of weeks as well again. Look at... Uh, Acts chapter 2, look at verse 42. Acts 2, 42. They, the early first century church, this is after Pentecost. The early church was primarily Jewish at the beginning. Gentiles didn't come in until Acts chapter 10. So you had the apostles and the disciples of Jesus, you know, probably about 150 people, something like that. Then all of a sudden, how many? 3,000 were added to them. Well, look what it says they were doing. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's first, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were doing these things together. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Because they believed about God's love. They reflected God's love. They learned it from Jesus. Love your neighbor. Love, you. love one another as I have loved you. Love your neighbor as yourself. They were concerned for each other. There was a reciprocation. And this is what we need to see here. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have what? Need. Same word that we saw in Titus 3.14, Crea. Now, it's interesting. This is not communism. What it was, if somebody had, somebody was in need of money, somebody would sell a piece of property and take the proceeds and give it to, to help some, who, who's ever in need. Now, you're going to remember something here. Why is, this, what, why is this necessary? Because when you believed in Jesus, remember the Gospels? This is right after the Gospels here, connected to the Gospels. You trusted in Jesus as Savior. You said publicly as a Jew that you were following Jesus of Nazareth. They cut you out of the synagogue. You couldn't, your business was gone. You, are, you were done. No one would do business with you because you've been kicked out of the synagogue and the le- Jewish leaders didn't want you having anything to do with somebody who followed Jesus of Nazareth. So they... They disown you, so therefore all your business contacts were gone. You're basically destitute. Unless you had some other way of uh, uh, doing business with people outside of Jerusalem and, uh, and, and, and in the Gentile community, you were done. You were poor. You were going to lose all, all you had. 
And so it was necessary that the church did this. Day by day, it says, they would continue with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Notice who added to their number. This is for those people out there who think you build a church by programs and all kinds of cr crazy Madison Avenue techniques. No, God brings the people in. And he doesn't, if he doesn't bring them in, he doesn't bring them in. It's God that does it. So, but notice that the emphasis there, of course, we're looking at the, the church helped each other out. They, they, they helped each other with, the, their, with needs. Look at the Romans, please. Look at Romans 12. Look at Romans 12, 9. Now, watch this one, the expression one another. We'll see this in about a couple of weeks about this, with the one another commands. There's several in this passage. The one another commands basically talk about reciprocation. God's love is reciprocating, helping each other, uh, you know, encouraging one another, uh, rebuking and, and, and confronting one another when we're out of line, you know, caring for each other, uh, helping each other with our needs, uh, going through things together, identifying with each other, helping at each other, in other words. Look at it says in Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Then look at what he says. Be devoted to one another. You be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. You know, that means defer to the other person. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Look at it says, contributing to the needs of the saints. That word needs, kreia, found in Titus 3.14, saw it in Acts 2 as well. Practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. My friend, uh, uh, my good uh, friend, uh, John Woodford, uh, who's, uh, who's, uh, uh, is, uh, supports this ministry, he's listened to him and his wife listen to the teach. I married them a few years back. They're in Massachusetts. His father is, is, uh, is dying. And so, uh, you know, John's, you know, the fa his father's saved and everything, but uh, he's like in his 80s, and he's, he's, he's going through the death proce process of dying. He's, I don't know how much time he has left, but I was talking to John the last couple of days. And, but, you know, I know it's going to be a tough thing for John. So he's my brother, and if it was, it, you know, he's losing his dad, and I, can, I just think, you know, one day I'm going to lose my dad if, if the Lord doesn't take me out first. But, you know, uh, I would want somebody to, to go through it with me and I'd help me as I go through that. Well, I want to help John as much as I can, whatever he needs. And, and John is, you know, that's your father's dying. So we're to, in, the, in the day he does die, we rejoice, uh, we weep with those who weep. And when somebody gets married, when they got married, him and Alex get married, I rejoice with them. You know, when something good happens, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody gets a raise, Jody gets a raise, Titus gets a raise, happy do it. T Tony gets a raise, great. Sue gets a raise, Tyler gets a raise. You know what I mean? Gets a raise, yeah, we rejoice with them. It's fun. It's good. And when things, go, when things are going bad, we have a, somebody's had something to happen, a tragedy or something, or loss of a loved one, or loss of a job, hey, we're to weep with each, each other, can be concerned with each other, interaction with each other. Then look at it says, be, in verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind. That means arrogant. Think you're better than them. Do not be wise in your own estimation. So, again, I, I brought you that passage in Romans 12 because it's, it, it kind of uh, echoes and gives, fills in some more about what Paul says in Titus 3.14. So if you could go now back to Titus, go to Titus 3.15, and we'll look at the last verse in the book, in this tiny little epistle, Paul to Titus in the, in the Cretan church. Look at Titus 3.15. I'm reading from my, the New American Standard at this point. It says, All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Now when he says, All who are with me greet you, that's used of individuals 
with Paul in Philippi, giving their regards or greeting to Titus. So where was Paul when he wrote this? In the introduction, he said he was in Philippi, which was actually the first, remember Acts 16 with Lydia, who was a, a, a businesswoman there? They, they got saved. The first church in Europe was in Philippi. It was a Roman colony. That meant it had a big Roman military presence there. A lot of retired Roman soldiers lived there. It was a, it had, uh, they didn't have to pay taxes because it was a Roman colony. And so this was where he was writing from. He loved those people. You read Philippians, he loved them. They did a lot for him when he was in prison. Now, then he says, greet those who love us in the faith. Uh, that's used to Paul and his companions giving their regards or greeting those Christians on the island of Crete who love them by means of faith in the word of God. The phrase, those who love us, is one word in the Greek. It's the word phileo, and this word speaks of those Christians on the island of Crete who love Paul and his companions based upon their association with the Christian faith, or in other words, based upon their obedience to the apostolic doctrine. L this word love, it's speaking of the affection. Uh, remember, it says uh, brotherly love. This is the idea with this word. We get the word Philadelphia, the city of bro brotherly love, from this Greek word. And so it's speaking of a brotherly love. It's an affection for each other that we should have. And so he's saying that, uh, greet those who love us in the faith. Those who love us, Paul and the group he was with in Philippi, he says, greet those on the island of Crete who love him and the people he's uh, he, he has with him, his companions, love us by means of the faith. Now, in the faith, we, it's a prepositional phrase. It's pre the preposition N is translated in by the New American Standard. The word for faith is the word pistis, and this word is referring to faith in the word of God indicating that Paul was sending along his greetings to those Christians in Crete who loved him because of their faith in the word of God. So what it's saying is they love Paul because they obeyed the word of God. Word of God says, Jesus taught, you know, love one another as I loved you. So he's saying that the people on the, are, are on, on the island of Crete love Paul because they obeyed the word of God. Namely, they obeyed the Lord's command in the word of God Love, you, uh, love one another as I have loved you. Now, this word pistis, faith, is the object of the preposition and, which is a marker of means. It's indicating the means by which they loved Paul, indicating that these Christians in Crete love Paul by means of faith in the word of God. So, in other words, well, we, the application for us is we should love one another by means of faith in the word of God, meaning by, because we obey God's word, we're going to love one another as God wants us to, as Christ loved. But it, it can only happen if we're doing it in obedience to what God's word says. Now, then we have the last phrase, grace be with you all. That refers to the means by which grace might be received, namely through the mind and thinking of Christ, the word of God, which is inspired uh, by the Holy Spirit. It refers to the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to Titus and the Cretan ch uh, church with regards to the Father's will for their lives. Here, what grace is speaking of is the word of God. It's speaking of the word of God which affects grace. I don't think Christians, they, they pass, I, I used to do this too, pass right over that expression, say, grace be with you all. You just say, see you later, everybody. And, but he actually, the grace there is speaking of the word of God because the grace of God is communicated to us through the teaching of the word of God. Think about that. We'd know nothing about the grace of God if it wasn't for the spirit of God speaking to us about God's grace through the word of God. How else, if you took the Bible out of it, how would you know the God's, of God's grace policy toward us, which is an expression of his attribute of love? How would you know that? You only know it through the word of God, and specifically through the spirit of God speaking through the word of God. So when he says, grace be with you all, he's saying, you know, may my grace uh, cause, may this grace that I've communicated in the epistle, the word of God, may it be manifested among all of you as a corporate unit. Meaning, I want you, he's saying, grace be with you all means I want you to apply what I've just taught you in this epistle. I want the grace of God, the word of God, be manifested in your relationships with each other. So, therefore, the spirit of God, speaking through the communication of the word of God to the believer's human spirit in this epistle regarding the will of the Father for Titus and the Cretan Christian community is the means by which grace is received by them as believers. So, Titus 3.15, and I'm reading from my translation, goes as follows. Each and every one of those who are with me give their regards to you, Everybody who's with Paul and Philippi gives their regards to the uh, Cretan church in Titus. Please give our regards to those who love us by means of faith, faith on the word of God. May this grace, the grace I've communicated in this epistle, 
cause itself to be manifested among all of you as a corporate unit. So what we see here is Paul's closing his letter to Titus and the Cretan church by informing Titus that all those Christians who were with him in Philippi when he wrote this letter gave their regards to him. He also requests, if you see, notice, that Titus give their regards to the Cretan uh, Christian community and specifically to those who affectionately love Paul by means of faith in the word of God. And of course, this faith of course, produces obedience to the word of God. Paul is obviously distinguishing these believers in Crete with those who were in apostasy that we've been talking about in this epistle. As a, they were in apostasy as a result of adhering to the Judaizers' teaching and the, the teaching of the apostate pastors who were listening to the Judaizers. So then Paul issues a final benediction by communicating to Titus and the Cretan Christian community that the grace of God expressed in this epistle would manifest itself among all of them as a corporate unit. So what we have here is, again, the grace of God here is the word of God because we learn about the grace of God through the word of God. So we have what we call a figure of metonymy here where the, uh, the grace is, a grace, God's grace is put for the word of God and because God's word is affecting this grace, meaning the Holy Spirit is speaking to us of what God wants us to do. That's grace. And Paul wants his, his wish, his prayer, his spirit-inspired prayer, is that what he taught them in this epistle would manifest itself in their relationships with each other. And that's what God, the Holy Spirit, wants from us. The Lord wants us, too, to apply what we've learned. He wants his word, his grace, his word of grace, manifested in our relationships, husband and wives, parents and children, uh, relationships in the church, and that's when we bring glory to God. That's when we're also performing good works, excellent works that are pleasing to God. Well, I hope you enjoyed this epistle. I know I did teaching it and studying it. And uh, we'll be moving on to the next subject next week. Let's, uh, now we're going to transition into the communion service. So uh, uh, the song I want to sing for the communion service is, uh, the very, is on page one. It's called A Love Song to My Savior. So if you could turn there and uh, the commun well, I'll sing that while the communion elements are being passed out.
sa pan. Oh, I'm in love with you, Jesus. For wiping my sins all away. Yes, I. Thank you very much, Tony, for passing out the communion elements. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, please. Verse 23. We come now to the communion service, and this is a command. All of us are commanded in the church age to obey this command. Uh, we, uh, this is the only ritual in the church age that believers are commanded. Uh, the observance of the Lord's Supper is basically to bring into remembrance our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. And we're to, uh, this is not a time to feel of self-loathing or uh, feeling bad for ourselves or feeling guilty about our past. Our sins have been forgiven. It's a time to express our thanksgiving. It's actually a test to see where we're at really spiritually because it, we're to bring into, it, it's a time where we're supposed to think about our Lord and who he is and what he did for us. Uh, we know that because the bread is speaking of the person of Christ. Uh, the unleavened bread, unleavened, uh, is basically symbolic of uh, sinlessness here in Jesus. Jesus was sinless, and this bread speaks of his sinless human nature, which he gave up for us. He became a human being at Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and he went to the cross. He became a man so he would die for us and die for our sins and free us from the bondage to, to sin and the devil. And uh, he was raised from the dead in his human nature. So this bread, we, when we take part in it, we, we partake of it, we're to bring into remembrance who Jesus is, the God-man. So what I say is, what you do is you think about who he is as the God-man. And, and thinking about, uh, you know, like when the song's being played, when someone's playing the song, I used to think, when, when I was at a, a church I was uh, ordained at, I'd think about, about the Lord, about who he was, the hypostatic union. What I knew about him is the God-man, that he was impeccable. I try to think about those things that I learned about him and to bring him into remembrance him when I, when I partook of the bread. And, of course, the juice, uh, it speaks of his death, his blood, the blood of Christ, his death on the cross, not only his, his physical death, which, of course, was important, which was uh, to, to destroy the sin nature, but also it was his spiritual death on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which was important too. Because remember, Adam and Eve, they fell spirit, they died spiritually first, and then it says 900 years later, they died physically. Remember, Jesus, uh, the Lord said, and it was Jesus, and that day you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. And that, and of course, that when they did, they didn't die immediately physically. They died spiritually, which is demonstrated by the fact that they hid themselves from God and they were afraid of God. So Jesus had died had, and his human nature had to die spiritually to negate the spiritual death of Adam, which he passed down to his progeny, and also the physical death that resulted of this, of this spiritual death. So Jesus dealt with those problems. He negated all that Adam did in the garden, and he gave us much more than Adam ever lost. And he did this all out of love. All out of love. And I'll tell you what, 
the only sometimes the only thing that keeps you going is going. If it, it, this might be, the, sometimes you'll go through things in life, and the only thing that will keep you going is knowing that God loves you, because that that's something we can hang our hat on. God's love gives us motivation. It gives us appreciation. It puts produces in us a heart of thanksgiving. You know, appreciation for Him, love for Him. So it says in 1 Corinthians 11.23, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let us partake of the bread. And then Paul writes, In the same way he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being so patient and loving us with his great love. We thank you, Father, for the things that we've learned here this morning and also throughout the book of Titus. We pray that these things would be a blessing to your people, that they would uh, practice these things, that they would be dedicated to performing excellent works, that we all would be, that we perform excellent works as a result of our obedience to what we've learned in this tiny epistle that Paul wrote to, to the Cretan church in Titus. We thank you, Father, for everyone that is here this morning. We thank you for every single person here in the Thompson home, as well as those who might be viewing or listening to this class on Pal Talk or the website. And we just pray, Father, that, again, that you would be glorified by this lesson. And we also thank you for another day of the Word of God. We also thank you for allowing us to bring into remembrance your Son. We thank you for this beautiful time that we can be alone with you and your Son and bring to remembrance his person and work for us. So, Father, uh, if there's anyone that's listening to my voice on the Internet or Pal Talk that has not believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior, I'm here to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born Son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. For the Father did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now you have a free will, a volition, and you could say to the Father in your own words that you're believing in his Son, Jesus Christ. There's no one listening. Uh, you might be at a computer. Uh, wherever it is, uh, you probably are at a computer, otherwise you couldn't hear my voice right now or see it. So you're at a computer, probably alone, maybe, and there's no one here that's bugging you for money or anything like that or telling you have to raise a hand, walk an aisle, or do some kind of embarrassing thing that you don't want to do. It's simple faith here. It's, and by that I mean you're not simply acknowledging that Jesus exists. That's the, one of the greatest attested facts of the ancient world. The question is, do you believe who he said he was, the Son of God? And he demonstrated that by rising from the dead. We have evidence and witnesses as revealed in the Bible, the New Testament, that said he did rise from the dead. We also, us believers here, have the witness of the Spirit in us, and we know he's risen from the dead. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be saved and have the Spirit indwelling us if it wasn't for that, because the Spirit was sent uh, after his resurrection to believers who trust in him. So we be a witness to the fact that he's risen from the dead. So our prayer, the prayer of all of us in this room, is that you would believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I must warn you that if you don't, and this is not a popular message, but you will if you reject Jesus Christ and you die without believing in him, you will face eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. The place is so terrible, I wouldn't want my enemies to go there. It's, it's so bad. And so I don't want you to go there. I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. But I can't make that decision for you. Uh, nobody else can make it for you. But it's that simple to do so. So my, my prayer, and all of us pray, that you would believe in Jesus as your Savior. Thank you, Father, for another day of the Word of God. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to pray for, uh, have a Sunday morning offering. And the song I'd like to thank, sing for us is uh, on page 69. It's called, I Am the Lord, Your God. And uh, we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. Uh, uh, for those who might be listening on the internet, there's a, if, you wanna, if you feel led by the, uh, the Lord to give to our ministry, and you should if you're benefiting from our teaching, Galatians 6.6 6 says that. And uh, we're to uh, 
reciprocate. Uh, th- uh, we're to share all good things with those who teach them, teach us. So uh, we take up this offering, and the people on the internet, you can use PayPal. Our address is there, PO box, and you want to send us a check, whatever w- what you want to do, if you if feel led. Um, and so this is an important time because we can express our appreciation for God, what He's done for us, and appreciation for the Word of God in this ministry. So uh, let's pray for this offering, Father. We pray that this offering would be given on a proper motivation by the power of the Spirit, that it would be a a good work, an excellent work, that would bring glory to you and benefit your people. We thank you, Father, for those who take part in the giving. We pray it would be a blessing to them. Your son taught it's more blessed to give than to receive. And also it would produce many thanksgiving to you, Father. And we just thank you again for those who take part in the giving. And we thank you for being so gracious to us and providing us the means to give, the jobs and the salaries that we have. Uh, Otherwise, we couldn't give. We didn't have these things. So we thank you, Father. We pray that we be good stewards with the finances that you have given to us. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. 